speaking of a crisis, we have a crisis of a different variety that uh, is going to be discussed imminently by Cassandra Fairbanks, a journalist who is joining us now and has a limited amount of time, so I wanted to bring her in quickly. Uh, Cassandra, if you can hear us and if you're there, welcome. How are hey, you? I can hear you now. Great. I'm doing well. How are you? In awe of the article that you wrote and the situation that you, um, you know, described in the embassy, can you, we, we read a lot, uh, a large portion of your article earlier on the stream in our introduction, but can you run us through again, just the crucial points and how, what it was like in the embassy when you were there recently? Right. So um, I went and visited him on Monday and things have gotten significantly stricter since I visited in January. Um, when I got there, I was six minutes early and they turned me away and they were like, no, you absolutely have to come back at the proper time. And I was like, but I don't have a phone or a watch. And they were like, well, <laughs> and so you could already tell like right away when I got there, I could tell that the vibe was not going to be very welcoming and that it wasn't going to be the way that it was the first time I visited, um, which was almost a year ago to the day. It was a few days before he got silenced. Um, so yeah, it, it immediately started off weird. And then I went in and I got searched and it was a normal, you know, procedure. They put me into the conference room that has cameras, you know, on one corner and then the other corner and the whole place, you know, they can see it. It's heavily surveilled. Um, and so he came in, he was like, you know, you have to leave exactly at five o'clock. Kept, you know, really drilling it in there. Um, and then let's see it I was just waiting and I saw Julian walk by he was in the um you know he was out in the, the hallway area and I could hear him start arguing with them because he didn't want to um he didn't want to do the meeting in that room because there was heavy surveillance there and they wanted him to go through a full body search in order to be able to come in and he, you know, he argued that this was, you know, completely unnecessary and things like that. And so then, let's see, um, a few minutes later, they slam the door shut. And so I'm like, all right, I'll just take out here then, I guess. Um, and I was in there for a little while. And then I, I went to go check the doors so I could get out and I was locked in. <laughs> um, and then I heard Julian outside fighting with the embassy staff um, because they refused refusing to let him come in unless I or unless he went through the search um, his lawyer couldn't even come in to update me on the situation without being searched it was a whole ordeal um, and then eventually he ended up they let me out of the room so that the ambassador could go in there and him and the ambassador got into quite a heated exchange and yeah that yeah, it's pretty much all in my article. Yeah, no, but uh, what do you have any insight? Like, why do you think they have escalated that level of surveillance and intrusion uh, in the embassy compared with the earlier times that you visited and the other journalists who have come to see Julian Assange? Well, I mean, the first time I visited, there was completely different staff and a different ambassador and um, things were a lot friendlier back then. The new, the new ambassador is clearly not as happy about the situation. Um, I guess this was actually only the second time that him and Julian had ever even spoke. And he's in the same building as him every day. So it's, it's pretty tense there. And obviously the US government has ramped up pressure on Ecuador and they want to make things as uncomfortable as possible for him so that he'll have to leave. Um, it's very clear what they're doing and they're certainly um, succeeding in making it unpleasant. Now, Kristen Haffrinson, the current editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, uh, compared the situation that you described to a prison cell. And I know in your article, you said that it was reminiscent of the times that you had visited a federal prison. Can you speak about that and the degree to which you think it is accurate to describe the embassy now as a prison cell rather than a place of refuge and asylum? Um, I think it was actually worse than a prison. It was way worse than visiting people in federal prison. Um, there you, you know, you're still under surveillance, but you can whisper, you can chat with each other. Um, it's, it, 
you, I felt like you have more privacy uh, in a, visiting somebody in a prison. But it was very similar, you know, um, in a prison, they search the inmates before an, a visit, they search you before a visit, they put you into a monitored area. Um, it's the same thing. Um, you know, they strictly enforce time limits, there's, they make it pretty uncomfortable. It was the same thing that they're doing in the embassy. I the mean, prison is an exercise yard too, isn't there? And there is, he doesn't have right. Yeah. It was, and there's also medical care, which he doesn't have either. Right. It was depressing. I mean, I only got to speak with him for eight minutes. Um, and it was, you know, supposed to be two hours. So it was quite a, quite a situation. No, what I really found striking about the insights that you provide in this article is the argument that he had with the ambassador in which uh, the ambassador told him to shut up. I mean, that uh, that is a really extraordinary peek into what's going on there that you provided us, Cassandra, I have to say. Yeah, when I heard him say that, I almost dropped my pen. I was like, what? Did he just seriously? I thought maybe I was hearing things. And then I heard Julian respond, and he was like, yes, I know you want me to shut up. The president has already gagged me. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, this is unbelievable. And then obviously the staff around that point noticed that I was taking notes and they weren't too pleased. So they turned on the TV with this obnoxious music and just kept turning it up and turning it up and turning it up. Um, How much longer can this go on, you think? I don't know. I Hopefully not that much longer. Hopefully something will happen and he can be free, but I think they're going to keep escalating the situation until he's either, you know, so uncomfortable and so miserable that he leaves or they're going to go in there and they're going to snatch him. I mean, they're clearly, that's clearly their objective here. They want to get rid of them and they're going to make it miserable until they get what they want. Please, anybody else want to jump in and ask Cassandra while she's with us for the next uh, 15 minutes or so? I, I didn't, um, I haven't had a chance to read your article. What was the context? Why did the ambassador say to Julian, shut up? Um, I could only hear bits of the conversation, but what was happening was they were kind of, they were arguing and Julian accused the ambassador of being an agent of the US government. And at that point, the ambassador got pretty angry and um, he fired back and he was like, I want you to shut up. And that's when Julian was like, yes, I know you want me to shut up. The president has already gagged me, prevented me from doing journalism. Um, and then I couldn't hear much after that because that was the point when they turned on the TV and uh, made it really loud. And the, the irony about all of this is that there used to be a white noise machine in that room so that the ambassador and other officials and diplomats could have conversations without people hearing it and without them being able to be spied on. But they took that equipment out so that people could spy on Julian Assange easier. And ironically, I, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to write this article if they still had that stuff in place. It, the notes that you took, did they attempt to confiscate your notes or you were allowed to take the notes out? No, I, I mean, I would have raised hell over that, but no, they didn't try and take my notes or anything. They they tried to prevent me from taking them by making it really loud. And it was it was funny, before they turned on the TV, there was like a woman walking around pretending to clean and she was just like jingling the keys really loud, like blatantly. And I was like, all right, guys. See you know, but what this... What, what this shows is that uh, Assange is still of sound mind. He knows what's going on. He's able to show extraordinary courage to confront the ambassador over these issues, rather than he's not being cowed in any way. I think that was encouraging for me anyway to, to read that. Oh, no, he's still fiery. <laughs> he's definitely still fighting, and he is not backing down, and he was fearless. I mean, I was shocked at how strong of a stance he was taking against the ambassador. Um, and he was right about everything that he was saying. Nothing, I don't think that he was out of line at all. Um, They're not breaking yeah. his spirit. They may be trying to break his body, but they are not breaking his spirit. Absolutely. 
Cassandra, it's Peter B. Collins, and I do want to apologize just before you joined us. I incorrectly credited your piece to Lissa. <laughs> and that oh, was no worries. But um, I was really struck by the bizarre idea that Julian, to move from his living quarters to a conference room, had to be searched. Exactly what did they suspect? Uh, he might have picked up a, a weapon, a recording device. You said he went into the room with a transistor radio to tr try to provide his own uh, uh, jammer <laughs> of their surveillance systems. But did they offer any explanation of why they had to search him? Um, well, from what it sounded like, he was trying to bring in a radio. And, you know, during previous visits, we have played a radio with static on it just to try and muffle voices a little bit. Um, I wrote about this in my article in January, but back at my previous visit, we used like a notebook and we were writing notes back and forth to each other. Um, and we had on the little radio so that we could try and, you know, minimize the amount of spying or at least make it harder for them. <laughs> Not that we were talking about anything bad, but it was just, you know, it's the principle of it. And so I think that the issue was that they didn't want him to bring in the radio because they wanted to be able to spy very clearly. And I think that they're also worried that because they've gagged and prevented him from sharing any political opinions or any stories or doing any of his work, they're afraid that he's going to give stories or information to other journalists. Um, so they were, I think that that was a big part of it too. They didn't want him to, to be able to pass stories to me um, or, you know, if a story showed up in the news later, they wanted to be able to go back through the conversations and see maybe if he had given it to me or I had passed it to somebody. Um, basically, they just, they want him completely silent. <laughs> and so they, they were making sure that that happened. But, but from what I understand, he hasn't had any access um, for a year now. So he could only be working on material that he had in the embassy before he was cut off from the internet a year ago this week, right? Um, I guess, I don't know. Uh huh. Okay, now, you. Cassandra, I, I believe last time you were there in January and you also spoke to us in the vigil, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you uh, said you weren't able to really write an article about this, that whatever you talked about to, to Julian was confidential. It wasn't as a, uh, an interview to be written about. And you only wrote, you did not reveal any of that. But in this case, you have revealed uh, quotes directly from him. I just wonder, did you have any hesitation to do that? Or did you feel totally free to do that because you wanted the world to know? And I'm glad you did, by the way. But I just wondered what your thought process was about writing this article. Um, I think that it was really important. I think that he doesn't have any means to talk about the illegality of what they're doing to him and the fact that they are working with the U.S. government against him, even though he is a political refugee. And he's not allowed to express that. And they made it so that he couldn't talk to me to express that. And so um, it had to be done. And I wanted to make sure that I got the quotes exactly right and I, so that there was no room for anybody to question anything. So I wrote it all down. Um, I, he knew that it was going to come out because <laughs> I was like, I'm writing this. Aha, uh -huh, you um, told him that. I see. But it's, um, yeah, in the, during our previous meeting, we talked about a lot of things that, you know, we, I didn't want to endanger his asylum. But in this case, they made it. It's their fault that I could overhear all this. If they had, hadn't gotten rid of the equipment that made it so that yeah. people couldn't overhear these conversations, then I wouldn't have been able to write it. It's their fault that I wrote it. So. Well, and, and building on uh, that could, point, could, I mean, any, oh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, uh, Cassandra, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering what the mood was like outside of the embassy, uh, if you got much of a feel for public opinion in Britain about Julian. Um, I know that the May, the Theresa May government could could possibly fail sometime soon, if it's replaced by Jeremy Corbyn and a labor government, maybe that'd be a different British government stance towards Julian. But I am wondering if you got a feel for what public opinion is like in London, or if people just are oblivious to, to Julian's plight. 
Um, I didn't really speak to a lot of people. I after I flew in really early uh, Monday morning and then I went to the embassy, got locked in a room <laughs> and then I rushed back to the hotel and wrote an article. And then um, the next day I went and did some tourist stuff and headed back. So I, I didn't really get a chance to speak to a lot of people generally about what was going on. Um, there was one incident though that happened that I didn't include in my article. Um, Right when I got to the embassy, there was a guy with a telescopic lens camera standing on the corner. And um, I was walking down Hans Crescent and he started taking photos of me like as I was walking, like very blatantly moving his camera. And then I walked about, a, I guess about a block and a half to the train station because I was meeting my boyfriend there because um, he was gonna hold on to my phone for me because I didn't want to bring it into the embassy because they can't, can't be trusted not to bug it or whatever. Um, so I was down waiting for him at the train station for about five minutes. And then the guy ended up showing up there too. And he started taking photos of me again there and my boyfriend. Um, so and that, was, missed, that was a little missed, weird. He missed Paul Manafort though when he came. Oh, that yeah, guy. imagine that, right? <laughs> did you, did well, your boyfriend take any photos of... Did your boyfriend take any photos of this person who was no, photographing you? I took photos of him. Yeah. So yeah, good. I just, I didn't end up including that because there was so much that happened that was way more important, but that was just another odd thing. Um, they were, it was just so blatant too. It was like, all right, <laughs> I see you yeah. clearly want me to see you. And I, I see you. And I wasn't sure. I thought maybe it was a reporter at first, but who knows? It's it was strange. And I, I feel like there's been a lot of like strange things that like that that happen outside of the embassy. Well, and yeah. building on your point about the fact that, you know, if it wasn't for them removing the white noise machine, you wouldn't have been able to hear a lot of the conversation. It seems like um, you know, it's almost as if they've created a situation where that regardless of anything that Assange could have told you about his situation here, you know, they created a story that was much more persuasive as to the conditions there than if they had allowed him to speak to you. Um, you know, so it, it, it's kind of, it's ironic to me, at least as an observer of the story that you wrote and the mayhem that ensued when you visited. Right. It was certainly interesting. And then the ambassador wouldn't speak to me. He seemed like personally angry at me when he came out. And I was just like, all right. Uh, he like stormed by because I was trying to ask him. I was like, you know, is this treatment specific to me? Or are you going to do this to everybody who visits him? Is this the new normal? Are you guys going to ser body search him and his lawyer every day? Um, but he, he just important questions. wouldn't yeah. even acknowledge me, didn't look at my general direction, stormed past slammed his door when he went into his office um it was do they, go, good. do they go into his room where he's living and know what he has in his possession and would know that he couldn't move a couple of meters away from his door to the conference room do they are they aware are they entering his room do you know i'm not sure mm -hmm. uh, what what are his relations like with the rest of the staff is there anyone there that he has any kind of decent social relations Any, anyone on in the embassy staff i'm not sure it seemed pretty icy when i was there um i don't know if it's always like that i do know that this is only the second time that he's ever spoke to the new ambassador and he's there every single day so that's a little strange um it certainly doesn't seem like a friendly atmosphere at all And I feel really bad for him in that regard because they're making it so difficult for him to have visitors. And there's not even the first time I visited, I remember thinking, wow, the people who work here are so cool. Like, at least he has, you know, these people around him that seem really great. Um, and I, especially the, the person who had answered the door and searched me and stuff. He was just so nice. And now all those people are gone. So all the people that he had built relationships with or friendly with or who supported the cause, they're, they're gone. So, um, I don't know, I feel like it's probably pretty lonely. What is your feeling about a Corbyn government? And did you ever discuss that with Julian? And, and if you did, can you tell us what he said about that? Um, I haven't discussed it with him, but 
even if I did, I wouldn't be able to yeah. repeat that because it's political. He's not right. allowed to have political right. opinion, remember? Right. <laughs> and well, he's not, he's that, not allowed yeah. to express them anyway. He can't express them. Yeah. Right. Well, he has a political he, opinion that the ambassador is an agent of the United States, but go on, sorry. Right. Does he, does he at least have a radio or a television that he can listen to, watch, to, so at least he knows what's going on in the world? Oh, yeah, I'm sure that he, he, he definitely know. knows what's happening in the world. Uh, he's not, he's not totally clueless. Um, he seems yes, very up to date. <laughs> well, uh, and for our viewers who maybe didn't uh, catch the introduction and who don't know the changes that have been made since he was isolated last year, where he was completely cut off and no journalists could go see him. Now, Ecuador, the Ecuadorian government has instituted this protocol which is a very complex set of rules where, as you say, Julian Assange is not allowed to speak about politics. He's not allowed to function as a journalist. Could you describe um, the type of rigor in this protocol that you had to follow in order to even visit, for example, like leaving your cell phone behind? Um, okay, so they give you an application to fill out. You have to provide you know, where you work, your employer's address, phone numbers, all that kind of information. You have to provide your social media. Um, your IMEI number, your serial number for your phone, your phone number, all sorts of data, just an absolutely ridiculous amount of stuff. So I, I opted to leave my phone behind because I did not want to give that information to the Ecuadorian government. But um, if you wanted to bring that stuff in, you, you would have to hand it over. The other option, if you don't provide the serial number and things like that, is to leave your, your phone with them at the front desk wasn't something I was going to do. But yeah, apparently he's been having a hard time getting visitors approved. Um, there was a somebody who wanted to visit him who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. They got denied. Uh, they thought that I was going to get denied because of the article that I wrote in January where I said that he was, you know, Stasi style surveillance. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't even think this was going to get approved, but they did. Um, I doubt that they'll, they'll prove me again now, but yeah, he's, it's definitely a much more difficult situation for him to have visitors and everything has to go through the ambassador. They even wrote on my, um, on the letter of approval that we had to stay in this room <laughs> because last time we had attempted to go into another office so that we could speak without the blatantly obvious cameras in our faces. Um, and they were very upset about that. So they made sure to write it in bold on my acceptance letter that it was exclusively in the conference room. But yeah, it's it's definitely not a comfortable situation for him or for the visitors. So, so Lisa, do you have any, uh, well, Lisa, do you have any questions or comments on uh, Cassandra's experience uh, from you know, as a, as a psychologist and after having written the series that you did? Well, it's driving home to me. I mean, one thing that was going through my mind as, as I was listening to you speak, Cassandra, was, um, I mean, this is really something that psychologists should be, I think, speaking out about because we're talking about somebody here being, you know, being abused on so many levels, human rights being abused, civil and political and legal rights being abused and... Um, it just seems like a logical place for psychology to be standing beside leading human rights organisations saying this is wrong, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, you know, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and Cassandra going and you going and visiting him, Cassandra, and, you know, explaining to everybody what it's like there really drives it home in a human way. Um, so I hope that that, you know, it's, uh, and it makes it more accessible and relatable to people. So I hope that will move some more people to... Um, um, you know, stand up and stand beside the organisations that are already denouncing this and saying that it's wrong to treat a journalist as a prisoner. Um, and I guess the other the other thing there that really sort of invites psychologists to take a stand is that it sounds like they're trying to psychologically force him out, you know, make it so psychologically unbearable for him that he leaves. And that's another thing that was going through my mind as you were speaking. So, um, yeah, I think it's a really important story for people to hear. And I hope it, I hope it moves some people who haven't come forth yet to come forth. <laughs>